Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Um, thank you. Waalaikum salam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you, brother Akil, for joining us at this uh, Zoom session. Um, it's it's very hard to uh, get hold of you. I know you're very busy. Um, tell us a bit about yourself before I do start asking you a couple of questions regarding um, certain issues in this apologetic uh, forum. Alhamdulillah, uh, Bismillah, Alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala Rasulullah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh to all. Um, first and foremost, thank uh, Mustafa Ahmed for allowing um, this opportunity to come and uh, sit with him and discuss some issues in apologetics. Alhamdulillah. Uh, exactly. As you mentioned, unfortunately, um, my schedule, my work schedule, um, is a bit tedious. Um, I do have a job, uh, I'm a contractor by profession. But for those who have also been following our channel, uh, you know that I, I, I relocated and moved out the country uh, overseas, me and my family. So we're there, and I come back periodically to the States uh, to work and to put some things in motion uh, to assure stability where we are. So uh, I'm in one of those phases now. I'm traveling. I mean, I'm back in the States. I'm doing some work. So, alhamdulillah, uh, Mustafa uh, took advantage of this opportunity to grab me and uh, alhamdulillah, uh, we're going to spend some time together, as well as some other brothers. Um, we're going to try to do some more uh, collaboration and networking uh, with the brothers in apologetics to um, make a, a bigger impact and refute um, the doubts that's caused. And this is our channel, Abdul Shubahat, uh, refuting the doubts. So, um, I got into uh, apologetics uh, about 2014 towards the end, 2015. And what sparked me was that um, before this, I, I wasn't big on social media. Uh, social media was something uh, I didn't partake in a lot. Uh, I watched YouTube, like for Islamic videos, um, but I didn't have uh, much activity on Facebook. I tried it uh, with my channel, uh, on my page for my business, to try to promote my business. But uh, it was just, um, it wasn't uh, to my to my appeal. Uh, I wasn't interested in a lot of people. A lot of people's personal business. I don't want to know uh, what you do in the morning before you go to work and why you're at work and all these things. Yeah. Also on Facebook. So I left it alone. It wasn't my interest. Uh, but when uh, I got into apologetics, I seen that many people were on uh, Facebook and YouTube uh, for God and stuff like that. So I made a channel specifically for these reasons. What sparked my interest, as I was mentioning, is that I was watching a video on the Quran. And I don't remember if it was like a lecture or if it was like a recitation of the Quran, something like this. But you know on YouTube, when you have a video that has the name or word from which you're watching, it can be underneath, whether it's from a, the same source or from an antagonistic source or something like that. So uh, I was watching a video on the Quran, and after the video finished, Underneath, it gave me a list of other videos that along the same topic. I seen this video by this guy named David Wood. This is 2014, I believe. Um, and I looked at him, and I looked at him again, and I seen uh, it seemed a bit strange that he would be making a video uh, on the Quran. Um, so I watched it, and when I watched it, I was really sure that uh, this guy wasn't the person to be doing videos on the Quran. But I was surprised at the conclusions uh, that he made uh, from whatever sources he was reading, uh, and it was just so far off. So I thought my, maybe it was a one-time video. I, I, I searched again, and I watched another video. And then I seen this guy had a channel. He was on the network. Uh, at that time, it was ABN, um, a Christian uh, channel, uh, which yeah. I was invited on some years back and did some um, some live broadcast on that channel as well. After um, we began to engage uh, with the community, Christian community and apologetics, but I began to watch these videos and I was really taken aback that the ignorance of this man, yet the the arrogance of him to come and uh, promote himself as some authority on Islam. So at that moment, I, I said that, you know, um, I, I'm going to deal with this guy. I, I'm going to um, 
you shoot this guy. And I begin a channel, and I named it Radu Shubuhat. Radu Shubuhat is uh, two words in Arabic. Uh, Rak means to, re to refute or respond. So if someone make a Rak, like um, you, you, you respond or refute. Like if I call someone on the phone and they don't answer, then I say he didn't respond, like, you know, he, 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 didn't, he didn't return or respond my call. So, right. um, and Shubuhat? And Shubuhat means doubts. So uh, it means uh, doubts, basically responding so to basically that. responding to the things that cause Muslims or non-Muslims doubts or problems about uh, Islam. Uh, so I I made this channel and I've been I've been promoting it now for about five years um, through its own initiative. Like I I don't do much outreach. I don't go to a lot of Islamic centers and broadcasts because some of the issues we deal with. Um, they're not for laymen Muslims to engage in, um, but for people who know about it, then they hear about these things, we, we welcome them and invite them to our channel to um, hear the reputation of these accusations that's made against Islam. So, and I say that because our subscription um, at, this, at this point uh, many people think it should be higher because of the work that we do. But I don't advocate and I don't advertise my channel to Islamic communities. Uh, because some, sometimes we don't need to introduce Muslims who are not uh, bothered by these issues into this matter. Uh, so it's not like uh, this is something that we want to just welcome Muslims come in and hear all this nonsense against Islam. Uh, because that also can be a tribulation and fit the foot in. So we leave it and we promote our channel by um, what we have on YouTube and amongst the apologetic community. Um, so mashallah, that's, that's good. Yeah, uh, mashallah, just to um, add to this, that you've not introduced it to brothers and sisters of Islam because you don't want to add more problems to, um, in Surah so they may start feeling doubtful, they might feel hurt, and so on. So, so you're keeping it just simple and saying, you know, we keep our site and we'll review and yeah brilliant i mean we definitely need more subscriptions uh to uh compete with what's out there of course but uh i i don't promote it in the muslim circles where maybe these matters are not prevalent to them yes. maybe they don't hear about some of these issues that may cause other muslims problems so we, there's no need for us to introduce to them right something that Previously, they wasn't tried with, and then they hear it. They say, "Oh wow, I never thought of that." And then now it becomes something for them of to uh, have a difficult time. Even though we make the reputation, nonetheless, we don't need to introduce them to something that's unnecessary uh, for them. So um, this is what we started in 2014. So at that time, I made some uh, advancements uh, to communicate to David Wood. I sent some emails to him. Yeah. And after a few, uh, I finally got a response. Uh, I challenged him to debate. And he finally responded back to me. And this is going to be part of our series that we're going to be doing against him. We're actually going to go through this series of emails on this correspondence that me and him had to expose him. Um, because he's been lying about our communication over the years to his followers. And even he lied to my face when I confronted him after the, uh, the debate with Muhammad Hijab. Um, so... Uh, what we find is that, you know, he ran out of ammunition in terms of topics and he's been refuted on almost everything he put out there. So now he's just turning into uh, something of like drama. And I, I call David Wood um, the Jerry Springer of apologetics. <laughs> uh, for many people who watched uh, years ago, I, I don't know if it's still airing, but I know some years ago, it was this uh, unfortunate individual named Jerry Springer. Yeah. And he had a show in which he would bring on the show, like, it was just drama. It was, uh, they call it yeah. baby mama drama. Yeah. Or yeah. all, all kind of, it was just nonsense. Yeah. But it got so much ratings yeah. because there's people who like to see this drama. Yeah. They're not interested in anything other than the drama and the theatrics of the show. And um, this is what David Wood. Uh, is like he he doesn't care about truth. He's not interested in anything uh, of truth and arriving to the truth and promoting it. Uh, he's interested in drama and he's interested in money. 
Uh, and these two, they go together. Uh, and he's using or capitalizing on the, um, the focus of the media against Islam uh, as a catalyst you know, saying, to further uh, his agenda. So, uh, and, and the proof of that, and again, this is part of what we're going to be exposing in our series against him uh, that we're going to be doing uh, once I return back so I have the proper um, setting and um, means to make a, a thorough uh, series. Uh, but if David Wood was interested in truth, you will find him talking about his own religion, his own faith. You will find him dealing with these things. I'm a Muslim. I, I love Islam. I love talking about Islam. I, I love engaging people about Islam. I welcome anybody to come with their questions or their doubts or their accusations. And welcome, hello, Sahlan, you come, uh, because Islam is, is is beloved to me. It's it's a passion yes. for me, and it's so. If you love something, you would want to talk about this thing and give it to other people. Of course, he never talks about Christianity. No. He never comes and does any videos about the Bible no. and doing commentary or explanation. Everything is about Islam. And the reason is because it brings him money. Yes. It brings him revenue. In contrast, you have his friend, his very close friend, his buddy, he used to do the show on ABN with, Sam Shimon. Ah. Sam Shimon is another person who, who loves to talk, to talk about attack, attack Islam. Yeah. But Sam Shimon also loves to talk about Christianity. He loves to talk about the Bible. Sam Shimon is broke. And needs money and asks his friends for money. David Wood is well off receiving thousands of dollars a month from Patreon and YouTube. The wow. difference is when Sam Shimon makes videos, he makes videos about Christianity for the most part. David Wood makes videos about Islam. Yeah. <laughs> David Wood is making good money. Sam Shimon is broke. <laughs> so and, and David Wood and David Wood ain't probably even supporting Sam Shimon. So Let's, let's, no, he's not. He's not. Unfortunately, he's not because uh, Sam Shimon asked people for money. And it was supposed to some time ago, which we're going to also highlight again, um, where they both was um, broke at some time, um, soliciting people for money. Um, it was supposed to be writing some books um, yeah, to make yeah. more money. And so all of this, this history, we, we, we're going to go through. We, we, we're going to bring history out about um, David Wood and just show the people, really, this is who this guy is. And if you take him serious as some type of um, authority on Islam, then really it shows your ignorance and your stupidity, unfortunately. But just to clarify this, brother, um, since 2014, you've had debates on the ABN Trinity channel, you've had many debates on MAP, um, the Muslim Apologist um, Apologetics podcast, you've, um, you've got your own YouTube page, um, also Incognito Productions. I mean, you've been involved in so much da'wah, um, as well as giving um, talks on Islam, you've been debating uh, Christians as well. So you're, you're recognized, we know you very well, you're up there. I mean, why is David Wood, after the recent debate he had with Muhammad Hijab, and you've discuss, you had a discussion with him, and we've got it on video, again, I'm sure you'll be yes. uploading those more, why is he still uh, denying, or, or I mean, the emails and, and refusing to debate you? I mean, what is it? What's so, what's so concerning about this? What would you say is concerning him? Well, I, I tell you, um, from from early on, early on, when I first got an encounter with David Wood, um, he accepted to debate me. Right, and at that at that point. I wasn't known to anyone. I was just actually starting in apologetics. Right. Um, and uh, I kind of just jumped straight in. I mean, even if I probably wasn't uh, ready for official uh, debate, it would have been my first time. Nonetheless, um, I, I know my stance. I know my, my background, my studies. I know uh, my uh, understanding of Islam and uh, my, my platform, you know, that is solid in that regard. Uh, so I went after him because I, I know that it's it's easy to refute him because his arguments are, are, are very frivolous and fallacious. But when I when he first responded back to me, um, in all due respect, I sent him a very respect, respectable uh, letter or email. But I mentioned to him I was taken aback by his um, engagement in lying and deceit uh, at the level, especially being a figure who has 
so many subscribers and yeah. is a public figure. Uh, so he didn't like that, that I accused him of, uh, of lying. So you he said, well, basically. yeah. He said uh, in the email, just went back and forth, uh, and these emails we actually going to highlight email by email, and I was serious and show his his, his followers um, the engagement that we had, right. uh, extensive engagement, so they can see that me and David's relationship is not something new, and it's not a matter of me um, just chasing him for no reason. There's a history behind us, and I want to bring this out because many people are thinking somehow that I just had some infatuation with him. And there's no historical connection between us and what we uh, proposed or looked at in the past. Right. So uh, he said, well, you're accusing me of lying. And if you don't prove what, you know, uh, present your proof for what you're saying, then I will discontinue uh, communicating with you. So I, I find it funny that he threatened to stop talking to me because I responded like, if you talk to me or don't talk to me, I don't, I don't really care. I live my entire life not knowing you. So yeah. if you don't say another word to me, it's not going to make me lose sleep. Lose my sleep, yeah. I said, <laughs> I said but the, the point is, is that I'm, I'm looking at your, your video, I'm looking at your material, and I'm looking at um, your approach, and you're not being honest. Now, again, this is, this is new. I mean, this is my introduction into um, the apologetics arena. And it was because of what I seen from him, and I thought that, you know, someone like this, how could they, like, have a following in the channel um, with this type of ignorance. And this also we want to expose because the funding and the support he got and the introduction and the, the, um, the people he, he surrounded himself with in, 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 in his beginning to propel him to get to this point also is going to be exposed. Uh, so we're going to bring all of this out in our series uh, step by step. Um, but um, this is what I, I, was, I was taken aback by. So I sent him, I said there's three points there's three points that, from what I've seen so far, are clear lies, clear lies um, that you have promoted against Islam. And one was his idea some time ago, him and his friend Sam, Sam Shimon, uh, especially Sam Shimon, but he, he, he stayed on the show with him, was about Allah being the moon god. This is one. Uh, another one was, I believe it was about the execution of 800 Jews yeah. uh, that's promoted. Bani, I think Bani this Bani one, uh, Reno, Reno yeah. Yes, this yeah, is another one. And the third one was about this lie, what is called Mufakhada. And this is about this, this, in English it's translated as spying. It's where in the video, they were explicitly saying that, uh, you know, uh, yes. Allah, like that the Prophet yeah, Muhammad said, I'm aware of that. That, that was know, Shams Shimon's was, argument that David Wood took on. Yeah. Well, I mean, in, in his video, he was the one, you know, saying uh, promoting it heavily, and he was uh, talking about it. So uh, they had an email about it on their website and stuff. So and the argument was that the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam engaged Aisha. She was so young that he couldn't um, engage her intimately. So he did some other. So uh, I, I challenged him on it, and he said, "Well, you know, bring me the proof." So I took off work one day. I took off work and I wrote a four-page refutation. I, I I I looked at his his he because he sent me the link to his email. I mean to his article about this lying um, lie. I took it and I called the work to my guys. I'm not coming in today. Um, I'm I'm taking I'm, I'm taking back uh, today. I wrote a four-page refutation in about maybe four or five hours. I finished it. I emailed it to him. I took everything, argument he put in his, in his report, and I brought up the box. And we're going to be highlighting this, and I also have this on my website, for anybody interested in seeing the article, on uh, the web, website, Auto Douche, we have all refuting the doubts. So I have a website, www.refutingthedoubts.com, and it has our videos, as well as some articles that I wrote on different topics. So it's on there for those who want to see the article, and we can maybe put it in the, in the link um, below in the information box. Yes, we, you have to, yeah. So I sent it to him, and when I sent it to him, that was it. The communication stopped, and I know he got it. So what happened is that on his videos, I used to make comments. Now, sometimes they would respond to some people in the comment box. He blocked me. I emailed him and followed up. He blocked me on the email. So I find it amazing that here it is, this person is attacking Islam, 
challenging people to um, prove them wrong. And, and I came full blown to come prove him wrong, and every every avenue he cut me off. Yeah, he disappeared. Drop me. Wrong, that's it. He's gone. <laughs> yes. So I mean, if you want to prove me wrong, then let's debate, and let's let's see. But you challenge the Muslims. A Muslim comes to accept your challenge. It comes at you, and you don't want to engage him. Wow. So this happened for some time. He blocked me on his YouTube. So when I comment, my comment wasn't shown there uh, on, on his email uh, and on. Up until one time, I, I contacted, I called in to the show he was on, ABN. And this is where uh, one of the introductions um, that I had to ABN. Um, but um, I called in the show. And interestingly enough, our brother, uh, C.L. Edwards, who was formerly Christian, yeah. and me and him actually had a debate. I, I, I traveled to his uh, state of Michigan. Um, I met him and his family, a nice family, and we debated. Two, we had two debates. One was on the nature of God, and the other one was on reform. What religion offers reform, true reform, Islam or Christianity? And also, I encourage those to check our channel and see those debates with our brother, C.L. Edwards. So he answered... Um, he was, on, he was doing a show with David Wood at that time. And I wanted to ask some questions. David Wood, um, I, I, did, I think maybe I called after the show was over or it was too late for the, for the call-in, so I missed it. But I ended up talking to Sierra for about maybe half an hour, going back and forth where we exchanged some views and stuff like that. So that was me and his introduction to each other. Um, so he mentioned to David Wood that I wanted to talk to him and uh, I, I wanted to debate with him. At this, at this point, David Wood knows who I am because we correspond through email. So he knows exactly who I am. I didn't talk to him that night, uh, but uh, I told the guy there that, you know, I'm looking to debate him and could he relay the message to him. Um, he made up some lies saying before that I said that um, I'm, I'm, I'm going to, I, some, something, some lie. I made a video about it. I forget exactly what he said, but he made some lie about me trying to enhance uh, my aggressive approach towards him. Then I called it again. So some time went past, and uh, ABA knows me now um, because I'm now doing some shows with them. I'm, I'm, I'm on some, some of their shows. And I believe it's uh, after this point that I started. But David Wood was on there. No, 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 actually, it wasn't because David Wood left the ABN before I started to do any shows on there. So this was before, but I've been calling a regular. So I was like a regular caller. I would call yeah. in and ask questions and stuff. I called on one show. They were was on live. They said, is, um, they put me through. I said, hey, they were, how are you? This is, this is Apple. He said, oh, uh, why do you let this guy on? Why do you let this guy through? I said, they're not supposed to let me through. You, you know, you welcome us to call. You challenge us. I call. So why would they yeah. answer my call? Let me through. He said, because you're a stalker. He said, you're a stalker. And we could post a video. I made a video of this excerpt. I have a record. I have a document. Uh, he said, you're a stalker. And he said, I feel sorry for any woman that you um, uh, uh, try to uh, get because you, you're a stalker. So I said, David Wood, if you stop running from me, I won't have to chase you. I, I wanna if you confront me and engage me, then I won't have to stalk you if you want to ca call me a stalker. But since you are a coward and you want to run, then I have to chase you in order to get your attention and make you face me like a man. You have to catch the chicken, so, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> so this video we have, we put on, on, on our channel. Uh, and again, this is, you know, he knows exactly who I am. He called me a stalker. Um, let's speed up to 2018, uh, when, or 19, this year, exactly, whatever year, um, yeah, just um, recently. Yes. Muhammad Hijab had a debate with David Wood. I happened to be in 2018, because it was in November last year. I happened to be in the United States. And I said, wow, the timing is excellent, because I'm in the United States for this time, and it's in New York City. It's New York. So uh, it's close to where I would be, Pennsylvania, New Jersey. Uh, I went, I said, I went missing for the world. I went, and... Um, uh, I attended the debate, and Muhammad Hijab crushed him. I mean, bad. Like 
you know, you could say he was rude or however it was. Uh, maybe some of the uh, things that they agreed to, he said he breached it. Whatever the case was, he trying to do damage control. Muhammad Hijab crushed him. He crushed him, like from you know, just from from a from a man point of view. He confronted him. He looked him in his face, and David Wood punked out, and he couldn't handle the pressure. And it was a terrible performance of a debate by David Wood. Terrible. Uh, and this is David Wood experienced pressure. He's always like this. He can never handle pressure. Uh, he's very good uh, behind his, his screen. He called Muslims uh, keyboard jihadis. He called them keyboard jihadis. I yeah. call him the cameraman crusader. This is, you know, <laughs> I come up with one for him. If you want to call Muslims behind keyboards, flagging your videos or writing against you as keyboard jihadis, then we call him the cameraman crusader. He's a, he's a camera boy behind, he's on, he's on his crusade behind the camera. He makes his videos, but when you engage him face to face, in person, he crumbles. So that debate, Muhammad Hijab crushed him. Afterward, I got some time, uh, afterwards, I, I got some time with him um, to ask him some questions and catch up for some lost time we had over the years. Um, I challenged him to a debate. I said, listen, I challenge you to a debate because this is the essence of this. Two debates. You bring any topic you want to talk about. I don't care what it is. Your favorite one, your most dearest one, um, you think the one, your strongest one, you bring any topic you want to talk about against Islam, and I will accept it, and we will debate upon it. And I also will bring a topic of my choice, and we will debate upon it. He said, okay, as long as we accept it. I said, anything you put, I accept. I don't care what you say. I accept it. I said, in the one I choose, you can accept it. I don't care the conditions. You make it. You draw it up. All I want to do is get you on stage and debate you and expose you. Wow. So he accepted. He said, okay, no problem. That was in November 2018. It's now April 2019, and I have yet to hear a follow-up, except recently he's been posting some excerpts of a video I made against him where I told Muslims to flag his channel. Yeah. Now, in this discussion we had after the debate with Muhammad Hijab, David Woods, he lied to my face. I told him, I said, I tried to remind him about our email correspondence some years ago. He said, oh, I don't remember any of that. Oh, okay. You don't remember any of the email correspondence we had years ago? You don't remember uh, I'm calling in and you're calling me a stalker or all these things? He seemed like, you know, somehow he don't remember who I am. and what I'm a liar. And he even agreed to have a debate with you. Uh, yes, I, I, I know he was lying, but I didn't have time to go back and forth there. I was just trying to establish uh, some things against him. But then in his recent video he made against me, where he showed some clips from my video. Yeah, he knows you now. <laughs> he said, well, he, he, said, he said, the reason he's been denying me is, a, is, is it was a tactic, and it worked out perfectly. So he's telling his followers that he's been denying me and avoiding me for years, trying to draw me in, and it worked per 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 perfectly. When he told me to my face, he don't recall or remember who I am, or these email correspondence at minimum. So all of this, we're going to bring our case, inshallah. I mean, we're going to really highlight all of this and just expose him. Uh, but this is the latest. And in this video he made against me, he didn't address my name. He don't say my name. He don't mention, you know, he says for, for the sake of the uh, video, we're going to call him the coward. So David Hood is calling me a coward. So for four years plus, he's been, you know, saying avoiding, you know, dealing with me. Uh, and confronted me, and yet he's going to call me a coward because I tell people to flag his videos because what he's doing is inciting hate against Islam unjustifiably. So um, this is the history. I mean, it's, it's, I took a little bit of time, but, you know, um, this is where we are now. So you ask me, why do I think uh, that he's avoiding me? It's because of this. This is the history, and you can see that from early on, uh, I guess he sits, I'm not like a, a passive type of guy. Um, so maybe uh, he don't feel comfortable in debating me face to face because, you know, I, I, I'm not passive and going to let him just say anything and walk around and lie against the slam without confronting him uh, in a very strong way. So um, this is what it is. And where we are now is uh, I think he still would avoid me until uh, it becomes clear to his followers 
that he is a coward. And he has no justification on why he's avoiding me other than to confront me and debate me. But the sad thing now, in closing, most of is that David Wood has taken a whole nother approach to this. And before, even though he disagreed with Islam, he made some mockery, uh, he still had a, a level of kind of like respectability when he engaged. Like when he debated Shabi Ali, he was respectable. You, you know, I mean, it wasn't, um, it wasn't belligerent, uh, like instance, Sam Shimon or Christian Prince or some of these other guys, that when you engage them, it's just, it's, it's, it's a waste of time. You can't talk to them. Um, they're foul mouth. they're belligerent, uh, they're disrespectful, um, very yeah. insulting. Uh, so when he engaged Shabi Ali, his demeanor wasn't like this. He no. still had a type of decorum with him in a debate setting. But now he's going to really like the gutter. And uh, even though, you know, uh, I still want to debate him and the challenge is still there, if he continues in this way, it, it becomes almost futile to debate him. And even though I don't think he will debate me, I don't think that he has the guts to confront me and sit on the stage with me face to face and engage me in a debate. Especially after it happened last time when he debated someone, you know what I'm saying, who, whose masculinity is forthright, um, you know, and don't, it's not going to pull any punches and call it for what it is. Uh, but um, I, I, I'm, I'm inclined to, 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 to stay away from debating him because now I think he's getting like the other guys. It's just becoming insulting, mocking, and it's not even academic anymore. No. Uh, and he's never really been academic. You know, he said he's going to write books, and this guy can't write a book, man. He, he don't have the acumen, the intelligence, the, the ability, the knowledge. Uh, to write a book. He's a script writer. He's a, he's a, he's a performer. Yeah. He's an opportunist. And, you know, again, like, he's a Jerry Springer of apologetics. And this is where we are now. And this is um, the history uh, between me and David Wood in, in, in brief. In our series, we will unpack more and expose more and show um, the behind the scenes uh, and, and the detail um, that we need to show to prove further. But this is um, the gist of our relationship from 2014 up until now. Wow, and 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 and, and it's just leading on as well because since uh, what the last November to now, we're looking at what six six months, seven months now. Um, I don't think you'll hear anything from him. You'll only hear more videos made by him and uh, uh, Volcal Malone, I think, the other guy, and John uh, McCry or something. You know, he's. Yeah, so that's yeah. what he's been doing. He, he's actually, instead of kind of his own thing he, he's been doing, his arguments have played out. He didn't did them over and over again. He's been refuting on them. But he done so much damage control. He done live um, broadcasts to talk about the debate. Everybody's coming defending him. Uh, San Shimon had to come and try to clear him up. And Christian Prince had to come try to clear him up. And he, everybody to, to do damage control because he lost the debate so bad. It was so bad. And then afterwards, even though it wasn't the debate between me and him, even just some of the basic questions I asked him, it was it was he was exposed so bad yeah. that he, he like he was in a frenzy. And you know what David Wood, he's you know, I mean his past is his past. He's a diagnosed um psychopath. Um that's you know, I mean, I don't know um how that came about in his life, but I am not making fun of that. But he said he mentions it. He's diagnosed as a psychopath, so he has mental issues. You know, David Wood wanted to be a superhero. Even on his icon for his YouTube um, page or his account, he has a picture of animation. The guy, he has a very childish mentality. He wants to be a superhero. He wants to be like the savior. I'm the one that took the slam down. He wants all the credit, you know, like. Never going to happen. Yeah. I mean, no, this, this, yeah. is, this is the mentality of someone who's a psychopath. I mean, he's you know, in a so wonder world now. He's in a wonder world now. He's thinking that. He's got so many followers and he's the leading top Christian apologist who can dialogue with anyone and he can take anyone on and he's the next to nothing. And he, I think he's, he's gone so far beyond now that he's losing his mind and he's just been stupid now. He's not serious. No one takes him serious. His followers who are supporting him, Patreon and all of that, they, they're just, again, like him. So, Brother Akil, now that you've given us the history about yourself and about David Wood, um, coming back to David Wood and his claims and all of his videos that he's making, 
they're all old arguments that have been already refuted. Um, what are your um, what are your take on his arguments? I mean, what has he become now? I mean, what what is he turning into? Okay, so again, um, the the uh, our channel was 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 was, was, was begun because of. Uh, what I seen in David Wood and uh, just the ignorance of this gentleman to be out there talking about Islam. David Wood has been doing this for about 20 years. Wow. Uh, I, I've been doing this for about five. And like even some of his followers, they, they, they leave comments on my, on my videos and they say, oh, you only have this many subscribers. And well, as we mentioned in the beginning, first and foremost, I don't promote my channel to the Muslim community because uh, it's apologetic and, we, and we're dealing with things that if Muslims are not um, privy to this, I don't need to introduce them to someone who's mocking Islam. I yes. don't need to bring that into their circle um, to have to see and be upset by somebody who's instigating, antagonizing, and mocking Islam. So I don't, I don't do uh, advertisement like that. Um, except for people who are in Dawah. Uh, David Wood has been on television programs. He's known. Communities support him. And he has another funder that's behind the scenes. And we're going to expose when we do our series. Uh, maybe two. Uh, and someone that you know helps promote his channel and views and everything. So in about a year's time, his subscriptions really skyrocketed at one point. Like it really skyrocketed. But he has a 15-year head start of where I, I am in comparison to him in terms of subscriptions, as well as a backing of people who are very anti-Islamic and want his uh, antics and his dramatization uh, against Islam to be promoted. So uh, he has uh, support behind him uh, financially, as well as um, like in terms of networking. Um, but I did a series against David Wood. It was called The 15 Biggest Lies of David Wood Exposed and Refuted. Yes. And I think we got to about 13 videos. And then I, I wanted to take the direction of the channel somewhere else because he began to get very played out. Uh, but then when his, when his focus kind of shifted to this, this clearly mocking, it kind of brought us back to at least deal with this. And once we do this series again, we're going to, again, depart away from uh, him because he's, a, he's becoming a waste of time. So we want to expose him now. No, of course, the difference uh, but the arguments, the arguments uh, the, to, to the question, the arguments that he brings, uh, Mustafa, um, they're, they're outdated arguments that's been uh, just recirculated. They've been refuted time and time again. Myself, others who are even more you know, um, um, proficient than I am, uh, they, they, they've been dealt with through articles, through videos, um, They've, they've been dealt with. But, again, he needs to do something to keep his channel going because it's his means of revenue. If you don't make videos and you don't get subscriptions and views, you don't make money, bottom line. So he'll make anything now. He's joining and doing all these things uh, with people to do, um, um, like a documentary or mocking. Um, but he has to keep his channel. You were saying about the mockumentary and the difference between... Um, your videos and his videos are that we don't mock or you are, make, you are not making any sort of mocking uh, towards uh, Christianity. You are just refuting his claims. But whereas he was making mockumentary where he would dress up in such a way and oh. Vocal Malone will do all of these ill stuff. I mean, they were being childish. They were being kiddish. Um, but but, but, that, but that's, that's who they are, though. That's, that's really that's who they are. And I mean, this really kind of just brought out kind of who they are. So, I mean, I made a video before I left, um, maybe before I traveled to the United States um, last month. Uh, but I, I was going to make it, it happen right after the New Zealand uh, attacks. Uh, but I didn't finish it, and I didn't upload it. But it was about this whole idea of mocking. And there's a beautiful idea in the Quran where Allah mentions to the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that indeed Allah is sufficient for those who are the mustahazi'un. And Allah says, وَكَفَيْنَاكَ الْمُسْتَحَزِيُونَ Allah is sufficient for you against those who mock. We, we're not worrying about the mocking. Allah will take care of their work and Allah will expose them. Wallahi, and this, we believe this firmly. We don't have no doubt about this. Yes. But we have a role to play 
as much as we are able and, 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 and taking the means as bad the law gives us to respond to it. So um, I, I wanted just to address the Muslims because sometimes Muslims we become so thin skinned we can't handle um, these people when, when they do these things. Mm. No, no, we don't. We don't need to get thin skinned We don't need to go into rage and uh, yeah. no. We deal with it in in, 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 in the best way and we call it for what it is. Um, but we don't need to get so disturbed yeah. that it, it bothers us. Um, but this is who he is. So we don't expect anything better from him um, at this point. Um, but we will address it and expose it. And I just want to expose the history of me and him, his lies, and really what he's in this for. And then I, I, I want to move on. I want to start looking at the, um, the dealing with atheism. Yes. I have a 23-page um like a uh, paper that I wrote that I'm trying to maybe get into a small booklet or like a script or something. So we, we don't work behind the scenes to do uh, more than spend our time on this foolish individual, but we do want to expose them thoroughly and inshallah, I'll leave it to the people to see exactly you know, what, what it's about. Inshallah, it will happen exposure. Now, I want to ask you a question. I mean, something that David Wood did bring up, um, and I believe uh, during one of your debate, um, uh, during one of your debate, I can't remember who it was with. Um, you did raise uh, uh, the, you did um, make um, a response to it. Um, Uthman radiallahu anhu burning the Qurans. Now this has been circulating so much online now on in social media that mm. yesterday when I was um, uh, online, I had a, a, a Christian guy who said about so we believe in the seven different modes of recitation, the ahruf. So he was like, well, how could that be when Uthman radiallahu anhu burned all the Qurans? He burnt them all. So that means he was only in the Qurayshi dialect. So how can you say there were seven different modes? Um, what is this story behind the, the burning of the Quran? I mean, briefly, I mean, I know you gave an elaborate answer last time, but just for the short time, uh, for the viewers who are going to watch this, uh, did Uthman radiallahu anhu really burn all the Qurans? Okay, first, <laughs> this whole idea about Uthman burning Qur'ans in plural is such a lie uh, because there was no Qur'ans in plural. There was one Mus'haf. There was only one Mus'haf. This Mus'haf, Mus'haf was written down during the time of Prophet Muhammad Wasallam, and it was collected during the time of Abu Bakr. It went from Abu Bakr and then it went to Omar. And then from Omar, it went to uh, Uthman. Actually, it went to Hafsa, Omar's daughter. She, she kept it. Yeah, that's... And then when Omar, when Uthman needed it, he called for, for Hafsa to bring the Mus'haf. There was only one official Mus'haf that was collected that was written down at the time of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu So a couple of things quickly. First and foremost, the Quran in totality was written down during the lifetime of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. That's first and foremost. I, I challenge any Christian to bring me any Bible that was written down during the time of Jesus Alayhi Salaam. That's first. You don't have anything. Not, not one record. Not one record. So that's first right. and foremost. Second of all, it was put into a book form only two years after the life of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam because Abu Bakr only lasted two years as a Khalifa before he died. So now, not only do we have the entire Quran in Mus'haf form written down, or well, not Mus'haf, but written down during the time of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, it's compiled only two years after his life, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Another challenge to the Christian community, bring me any manuscript you have that's within two years of the time of Isa Alaihi Salam. We have mm -hmm. the entire Mus'haf written down completely in a book form two years after the advent of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. That's two. Three, it went to Omar and it was, he kept it with him as an official copy. Only one official copy. When he died 10 years later, it went to Hafsa, his daughter, who was also the wife of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. During the time of Uthman, many people become Muslims. The Islam is spreading. And people don't know how to pronounce correctly the Quran, and also not aware that it has different variations. 
that was articulated by the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu When Umar ibn Khattab, he came, he heard a man reciting Surah Al-Furqan. And the man was in prayer. And Umar said, it, 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 it occurred to me to grab him even while he was in prayer, but I refrained myself because of the sanctity of the prayer. And I waited till he finished. But when he finished, I dragged him to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu And I mm-hmm. said, this man was reciting the Quran in a different way from how you taught me. What do we get from this? First and foremost, the emphasis and the seriousness that the Sahaba took about protecting and making sure the Quran was recited exactly how the Prophet Muhammad gave them. Yes, so when one Sahaba heard somebody recited it differently or mistaken, he dragged them and he put him to the Prophet Muhammad So this wow. shows us that even amongst the Sahaba, their ardent concern about making sure the Quran is preserved exactly as it came down from the mouth of the Prophet Muhammad So this is proof of itself that the Muslims were very serious about making sure this Quran is preserved. Two is that the variances that we do find even to today were sanctioned and known about and authorized and given by the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa himself. Because he said, he told the man, he said, recite. And he recited. He said, Umar, now you recite. And Umar recited. He said, both of you are correct. Both of you are correct because the Quran has been revealed with seven different ahruf. So from the time of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa we see that these variances that we see now were known and sanctioned and taught by the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. That's another point that we need to always keep in mind. Now, about burning the different masahif, or the, the, uh, the, the, the um, not the masahif itself, but the, the papers that people had, the awraq, because that's what they had. They just had copies, their own personal copies. At the time of Uthman, you had Sahaba who knew the Quran, and they had their own personal copies. They write their notes, they would write maybe as Babu Nuzul, when this ayah was revealed, about it, the tafsir. They had their own personal mushaf, or not um, copy of the, of the Quran. But it's not called mushaf. It's not called Quran. This is their personal copy. It's as if I had okay. an original, and someone copied from that. It's their own personal copy. Yeah. It's, it, it cannot be called mushaf because it's not a standard authorized um, yeah. representation of the Quran. Yeah. This is a, someone's personal copy. It has notes. Maybe it only has half. It don't have the entire, the entire Quran. Maybe five chapters. Maybe ten chapters. Nonetheless, it's a personal copy. When Uthman came with this dilemma, he realized the Muslims were having a, a big issue about the Quran, recitation, ignorance of language. He said, bring me all of the personal copies that people have in circulation. I'm going to get rid of your personal copies, not various Quran. There was no various Quran. That's a lie. There was only one Mus'haf. And that one Mus'haf, he got from Hafsa. He said, bring me this one Mus'haf that was in the house of Hafsa, that was with Omar for 10 years, that was with Abu Bakr for two years and codified unto him, and that was written during the time of Prophet Muhammad The same mm-hmm. exact one. He said, bring it to me, and I will copy from this one. Wow. I will copy from this one. And I will send it out to all of the people to use so there won't be any more khilaf or problems about the Quran. And then when he finished, he took the original Mus'haf and gave it back to Hafsa. That one was never destroyed or burned. The one he took from Hafsa, when he finished it, he gave it back to Hafsa. He gave it back to her. He didn't, he didn't burn that one. He never burned any Quran. He burned personal copies that people had so there would be no confusion about what the Quran was. This idea that both men burn Qurans is a lie. He burned any existing personal copy that was circulating or people had so there wouldn't be any confusion. And he used the only standard one that was in existence that was what Hafsa that she got from my father Umar for 10 years that he got from Abu Bakr for two years that was written during the time of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. There is no doubt about the preservation of the Quran, and Uthman didn't do anything other than take what we had as a standard and assist uh, a problem that was occurring amongst the Muslims because of new Muslims and ignorance of how to recite the Quran. Alhamdulillah.
Well, and, and, and it showed as well because it's amazing that when they say Uthman radiallahu anhu, he burnt the Quran, um, it, it doesn't make any sense when they say that because Uthman, radi- Uthman radiallahu anhu was living during the time of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him as well. So, huh. how could he have burnt the Quran and then nobody would challenge him on that and say, hold on a second, you've burnt everything that we know of? You know, he was living during the time of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. And it's amazing when we read um, the book. Um, a comparative study with the Old Testament, Muhammad Mustafa al-Azmi, page 100 um, and 101, it talks about um, the studies of Mus'haf of Malik bin Abi Amir al-Asbahi, where they made a comparison between Uthman radiallahu anhu's Mus'haf, Mus'haf and another personal copy kept by a well-known scholar, Malik bin Anas. Um, so yeah. there was personal copies that they found and they compared yeah. it. And they said, wait, there is no mistakes and there's no changes. <laughs> But Malik, Malik, this is Imam Malik, Malik ibn Anis, this is Imam yeah. Malik from before Imams, uh, yeah. he came after Uthman. He came yeah. after Uthman. But the point, the point being is that Uthman never burned any Mus'haf. No. When we say Mus'haf, we talk about the Qur'an from Al-Fatiha to Nas. Yes. And there was only one that existed, and that was the Hafsa. That's it. He borrowed it, he copied from it. And he returned it. Yeah, returned it. The only thing he burned was personal papers that people had in circulation or with them about the Quran, which were not authorized and which 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 could have had mistakes. We could have had errors. We could have. Yes. You know, they could they have been tafsir, had commentary, had their own notes. They had maybe not the whole Quran. This was their personal copy. Like for instance, when I when before when I used to memorize Quran some time ago. Um, I used to write down the surah. I would write down the whole surah in Arabic. And I would take it with me. So I'm, I'm copying it from the Mus'haf. I'm listening to the, the, the Shishik. And I'm, I'm copying the, the Quran on paper. Now I'm walking around with a piece of paper that has Quran on it. Is this Quran? Is this called the Quran? No, it's a paper, my personal copy. It's not Mus'haf, it's nothing. It's just my personal copy that I wrote down. That I keep with me for my own personal reasons. I'm memorizing it. Maybe I use it. It has dua in it. I want to memorize the dua. I want to use it. You know, what I'm saying for istiada. In any in any case, it's a personal copy that belongs to me. And some Sahaba, <coughs> like Ibn Mas'ud, he didn't want to relinquish his personal copy because it had tafsir in it. It had his personal notes. It had everything that he's been writing down for years now. And he said, I don't want to get rid of this. I mean, this has this is years of labor. And told you for me, you know, writing down as bad news all and this reason for this and how this is recited, all of these various sciences that came with the Quran. I don't want to get rid of this. And he debated with men on this. But it wasn't a must have. It was his personal copy. And what Uthman wanted to do, he wanted to destroy any personal copy that someone had. So later on, someone could come and say, see, this is different Quran, is it there's a khilaf, there's a problem. No. If he dealt with away with everything that was in circulation that was not from the most half, he thought this would alleviate the problem. And this, this is all he did. No, you're right. It's, did. it's the same as it's the same as going to a Christian and giving them a Bible which is handwritten and say, "Here you go, read this." And they'll be like, "Well, that's not the Bible." I'll say, "Why not? I've written it. I've copied it." So, well, you may have made some mistakes in it. You know, it just doesn't make any sense that well, you're going to take. Yeah, so that's true too. But but in, in early, remember, in early times. That was the only means of how they transcribe through writing. Yeah. So saying that, you know, writing it, this is a copy of it, is no problem. The thing is, who standardized this? Who authorized this? There was only one authorized copy, one authorized Mus'haf, and that was what Haf saw. And Uthman borrowed it, he copied from it, and he returned it. What he learned was not the Quran, and it was not no. the, the Mus'haf. It was personal copies. And this is all he did. He, he didn't never burn the Mus'haf or the Quran. And also ever. remember, they were all memorized as well. Uh, the Sahabas, they memorized the Quran. Zaid bin Tabi, the anhu, he, he rewrote the Quran as in like, he was the author again. So it no. shows that um, the, the collection was perfectly no. um, done. The, the preservation was perfect. There was no um, uh, any sort of um, issues, unlike the, the Bible. So, um, so there was no burning 
knowledge of the Quran. Uthman radiallahu anhu did not destroy. <laughs> Listen, this, 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 this is a lie. And, and, and even Muslims, even Muslims, they, they, they regurgitate this expression that Uthman burned Qurans. Uthman never burned any Quran. He burned personal copies that was in circulation or that was with some of the Sahaba at that time. The official and standard Mus'haf that was written down during the time of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu that was codified in the life of Abu Bakr, that was kept with Umar, and that was given to Hafsa after his death, Uthman borrowed this, he used it to make sure, he told Zayd ibn Thabit to write from this, and to make sure that this is the, uh, which you, 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 you copy from, and send out to different provinces, and when he finished, he returned it back to Hafsa. What he burned was not called Quran, and it was not called Mus'haf. It was personal copies, and that's all he did. The original copy, the standard copy, was kept pristine. When he finished, he gave it back to Hafsa, and Alhamdulillah. And this is the promise of Allah. Allah says that indeed we have sent down this Quran, and we will protect it. In the in Allah Alhamdulillah, we, we, the Muslims are sure that our book is preserved. And again, even look at the, the, the way the Sahaba was uh, adamant about making sure people pronounce it correctly. Omar wanted to grab the guy while he was praying because he thought he was saying it wrongly. They didn't pray with this. They knew this is the word of God. They knew this is the word of Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is, I, I did a series on this. Every Sahaba, real, real, real quickly, every Sahaba believed at inception, that the Quran was the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Every Sahaba. Yes. They believed coming from Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that the Quran was the word of Allah and it was coming to them directly from the Prophet, through the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. You tell me one disciple of Jesus, peace be upon him, according to biblical history, that thought that anything at that time that he had coming out of his mouth or written down was God's word. You think that Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John thought they were writing the Word of God? That later on this would become God's Word? They had no idea that what they wrote as historical records would later on be called God's Word. While the contrast to that, in the Muslim community, every single Sahaba knew that what was coming from Prophet Muhammad as it was the Quran, was the Word of Allah, subhanahu wa ta'ala, and they didn't, they didn't play with it at all. They didn't take it for no joke. No, of course not. And, and, and remember, the, the Quran was also memorized, and, and the Sahaba, they, 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 like you said, they were so strict in abiding by, by, the, by the rulings of the Quran. They never doubted the Quran. They knew every single word from the Quran is the word of Allah. Yes. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. Um, this, this sick thought of all the Qurans being burnt and everything's missing coming from the Christian um, anti-Muslims and David would promoting it with his um, with his uh, friend, well, uh, Nabil Qureshi who passed away, they just failed. They constantly failed and they still are failing. <laughs> and I know the thing about it, me. The thing about it, Mustafa, is that they take, they take chips from Islamic history, and then they exaggerate or they lie, and then they give you an impression of history that, that wasn't the case. No. They take false narrations, fabricated hadith, fabricated stories, and then they, they take one thing that might be true, and they put it all together and say, here's a story, see? As if somehow the fabrications corroborate with the, the, the piece of truth they have. So when Muslims hear this for the first time, they say, oh, wow, that hadith is in Sayyid Bukhari, and that commentary is in Ibn, uh, Ibn Kathir, or Tabari, or Qurtubi, or this tafsir, that tafsir. And then now it's like, well, I never knew that. But it's, it's a concoction. It's a lie. You take a little piece of truth, and you mix it with falsehood, and you serve it to the Muslims as if this is what happened in history. And this is what these guys did. David Wood is very good at this. He's very good at manipulating things from Islamic history and trying to tie it into something that's authentic and then p producing something that was never meant to be the case. Uh, they like to use um, Imam Sayyuti a lot as well. Um, Imam Sayyuti, when, when it comes to the preservation of the Quran, I've, I've read quite a few 
that they 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 want to write. But but they the amazing thing is that Imam the book of Imam Suyuti wasn't written in English. Um, it was in Arabic, and uh, oh, for sure. <laughs> it, 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 apparently it wasn't even authorized. The English version is not even the authorized version. If you know what I mean. But in any case, even 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 if it wasn't in English, what is the conclusion of Imam Suyuti, rahimahullah? What's his conclusion about the Quran? It's, it's protected the word of a God. Yeah. <laughs> so he's giving you an academic historical backdrop about some things and how scholars look like this and look at like that. And yeah. some of the things he put, you know, saying is not always consistent with um, what the facts are. But he's a scholar and he did the best he can, and Allah is going to be with him for his efforts. But at the end of the day, he must use he's a Muslim who believes in the preservation of the Quran, who believes in the authenticity of the Quran. So whatever he's writing, it doesn't. How to take his belief about the Quran? No, it's not. And so, also remember abrogation. There, 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 there's been abrogations made, and that they would say, "Oh, this surah should have been in the Quran, but it's not in the Quran. Why not?" And you think, "Well, that's an abrogation, or it wasn't meant to be in the Quran." And then they say, "No, it should be in the Quran." Or there's missing words in the Quran. You say, "How could it be missing when we already know what the surah is?" Like, yeah. like there's like um the the uh, what was the amazing one? The goat or the sheep? <laughs> uh, um, uh, chapter of the Quran, hey. which was the uh, verse of the stoning, and then we read in Sahih al Muslim where Uthman radiallahu anhu saying that, or was it Umar or Uthman radiallahu anhu saying that we still remember the surah of stoning? So wow. they still remember the verse, yet you're telling me it's gone missing and we don't know what it is. So you need to make up your mind what you're, <laughs> do you see? Two things, first and foremost, the hadith about the gold is a, is a, is a, is a da'if hadith. Yeah, no. Da'if. I mean, so. I mean, again, you're building a premise of something that's already weak and not even established. Yeah. It's weak. It, it, so it, it's, we don't even discuss it. It's, it's there, but the hadith is not authentic. So how are you going to base an argument against the Quran of something that's fabricated? It, it's like, for instance, see, the Christians, you know, they, 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 they like to the meddle in uh, fabrication when it comes to Islam. But let's take your books. Let's take the books of Apocrypha. And let's start saying, you know something, we're going to recreate Christian history based on the apocryphal works. We're going to say Jesus had, had a relationship with Mary Magdalene because it's in your apocryphal works. We're going to say Jesus was a crucified because it's in your apocryphal works. We're going to say all of these things that you oppose, but we're going to say, look, it's in your books. Most of them write this. Most of them write the Gospel of Thomas. Most of them write the Gospel of Peter. Most of them write in the, the, epistle, the epistle of Barnabas. Not the Gospel of Barnabas, yeah. which is, we believe, to probably be a fabrication, but this called the Epistle of Barnabas, which is considered by many, at least early on, as part of the Bible. It yeah. was in the first codex, but it's not in the Bible today. Sinaiticus. It was in part so, of yeah, so, so the, the Codex Sinaiticus was the first full codex um, that was um, put into uh, circulation, and the books that was in that one are not in the books on uh, the Bible today. No. If we begin to take your apocryphal works and rewrite your Christian history, they would have a problem with it. <laughs> Yet you want to take Da'if Hadith, Da'if Sirah, Da'if Tafsir, and try to rewrite history and make it against Islam when you want to accept it for your own works, for your own books. So what would so, happen, Brother Akil, if we, um, just to close in quickly, is that uh, what what is the threat now for Christians? I mean, are they worried? Okay, let me ask you now. So, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. Salaam. We, salam, salam. Let's just say we found the Bible from the first century and it has his name written inside or mentioned about him with his name. What would that do to Christianity? Would they? Do you think that would be a, a, a big issue for them, or how would they react to this? Because their argument is Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is not mentioned in the Bible. They don't want him to be mentioned in the Bible. But what if we do give him give him strong evidence that yes, he is in the Bible? Would that cause them? And <laughs> I mean, they will reject it first and foremost. No, first and foremost, they will reject it. They will say this is not true. They will say this 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 is not authentic. We know they will reject it. And Allah mentions in the Quran, Allah mentions in the Quran, they will reject it even though if they know that you know, uh, it was authentic, they will reject it. Yeah. That's first and foremost. Second of all, the Muslims, our argument has to be clear that when we uh, try to help the Christian understand 
Prophet Muhammad وسلم, as being in their books, we're not doing it somehow to authenticate Islam or to authenticate the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, or to authenticate the Quran. We're doing it because we're trying to show the Christian community that it's incumbent upon you to accept this man. But Allah has already authenticated the Prophet Muhammad وسلم. We don't need authentication from the Bible. No. The Quran is already authenticated from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We don't need anything to authenticate it. Allah has already authenticated it. Allah has already made it clear that this is the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from him. But when we go to the, 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 the Bible and say, look, these verses indicate or uh, uh, give serious credence to the life of Prophet Muhammad Sallam as a prophecy, we're doing it to show them that this man is a succession to all the other prophets and is incumbent upon you to follow him and the science is even in your own books. You can reject it, and then you have accountable for it. Or you can accept it and follow him, just like you're supposed to follow all other prophets. And also, is that when we say that a prophet is, is mentioned in a book, it doesn't mean even that we have to see his name. Yeah. Because Jesus, they say he's prophesied about the Old Testament, and not one single time you find his name in the Old Testament. So how are you going to tell me that Jesus is prophesied about in the Old Testament, yet you can't find his name there. If I tell you the Prophet Muhammad is also prophesied about, you say, show me his name. Show me Jesus' name. No, but the Quran doesn't, but the amazing thing is, Surah 7157 does not say um, <coughs> that his name is mentioned. They say you find his, him described in the Torah yes. and in Jil, or you find him written. It doesn't say that his name is mentioned. Um, this is where the yeah. Christians actually got it wrong. When they say, show me the name Muhammad Wasallam," we're not saying that the name Muhammad Wasallam will be um, explicitly uh, written down. We're saying that he's described. And then Allah gives a description of how he will loosen the burden and how he will speak the truth yeah. and how so, so, you know, there's a big long description about him. So go through the description and then use your methodology that you used to uh, find Jesus, peace be upon him, in your Bible, or the Old Testament, and then use the same methodology. That's it. We're trying to be reasonable with you, and we're trying to, you know. <laughs> but also, in, in, the, in that same ayat, Allah says, it is upon them to accept him and support him. Yes. Yes. So, you know, and it's funny because when we look at the history of Islam, the Jewish communities that was in Medina, first and foremost, what were the Jews doing in Medina? Exactly. They were waiting for the prophet to come, according to their books. They were waiting for, because why are the Jew, Jews in Medina? There's no need. They were was, there was there waiting because, according to their books, this is a place that the description of the prophet will come in this, loca in this location. Wow. So they were there in Medina waiting for him to come. And when they came, like, for instance, his wife, Sophia, which is another lie about the prophet forcing her into marriage, all kind of stuff, she heard from her father and her uncle very early on. When he first came to Medina, and he's the one that's prophesied in the books. And the uncle asked the father, said, what will you do? He said, I will never accept him. He's not Jewish. I will never accept him. I will oppose him. Even though they recognized he was the one prophesied in their books. This is a woman who witnessed from the time he came to Medina, her uncle and her father mentioned about he's the true prophet that we're waiting for in our books. SubhanAllah. So even if it was the, 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 uh, they found an ancient manuscript that gave clear indication of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, they would, they would reject it. They wouldn't accept it. And in one place in the Quran, Allah mentions about Isa Alayhi Salam, he said that there's a prophet coming after me, Ismail Ahmed, and his name is going to be Ahmed. Yes, so that's exactly. Ahmed is the name of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in the heavens. So, in, 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 um, with Jesus left, there's a, there's a prediction about a, a prophet to come. His name is Ahmed. Exactly where is this? We don't know because first and foremost, we don't have that one original script that was written or said by Jesus in his language. Yes. The very first copy, even if you, what you call the original of the, the, the Bible, the New Testament, was written in Greek. So already you lost the original mm -hmm. language to even know if Ahmed was mentioned in it or not. Yes, you're right. So, I mean, we don't care whether they accept it or don't accept it. It's, it's on them. 
I mean, you're gonna be hella, you know, you're gonna have to come up by law. Allah gonna question you about it, and you're not gonna have any excuse. No. And Allah has already Allah. told us, and we know. Allah guide him. We 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 yeah, of course we we don't need the Bible to give us uh to, for for proof of proper. Not, not at all. Not this at all. This is directed to the Christians and Jews, not to us. Uh, but most of all, I'm doing a series again because of my travels. I, I put out the first introduction, but I'm doing a series. It's called the Land of Buwa, and which is it's called the proofs of prophethood. Yeah, it's prophethood. Yeah. So I'm going to be highlighting a, a, a number of proofs that the Prophet Muhammad Sallam is a true prophet from Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala, and I, I did it in three phases: before his mission as a prophet, during his mission as a prophet. And after his mission, after his life, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And I'm going to just show how, in each phase of his life and even after, that he is indeed a true prophet from God Almighty. That's and cool. just uh, once I get back and have the time, inshallah, uh, to uh, do it, um, we hope to, you know, to get this out as soon as we can. This is at least uh, another month or so away because my travels is going to take me another month before I even return. But in any case, inshallah, we're trying to do some work um, and you know, give the Muslims um, some um, excitement and encouragement and um, like uh, confidence about being Muslim and that we don't have anything to worry about in terms of uh, what they accuse uh, Islam of. They accuse the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi of many things. Like for instance, this whole idea about Aisha. Um, I, I really, uh, I have something special for David Wood uh, because the night that uh, he had the baby Muhammad Hijab, he discussed his idea uh, or this, this, this matter about Aisha, her age, and we, we, we dealt with this, uh, but the conversation didn't finish because the uh, security uh, made us to exit. Um, but uh, we discussed in the Bible the marriage of Isaac to Rebecca. Yeah. And we mentioned that according to uh, Christians, I mean, not Christian, but biblical scholars, Jewish scholars, uh, Rebecca was three years old. Yes. Three years old. Now David Wood contends this vehemently. He contends this vehemently. But I want to get him. I swear I want to get him face to face. And I want to show him. From when you look at the verse of the Bible, it proves she was three years old. It, it, it mentions the age of Isaac when he married. It mentions his mother when she died. It mentions the year um, that Rebecca was born. When you take all these verses, about three or four verses, when you take them and put them together, it's clear, according to the Bible, the Old Testament, that she was only three years old. Wow. When you look at Jewish commentary, they say a girl is eligible for marriage. The youngest is three years and one day. Yes. And you can actually go into her. Oof. I mean, this is commentary. This is yes. biblical commentary. The Christians can sit there and say whatever they want to say. But you're reading previous scripture. When you look at all of the corroborating verses, the age and the times and everything, it proves that she was only three years old. And I'm going to do something on it. It's just so many things came at me and I'm traveling um, and I'm sitting on all these ideas and stuff. But, um, I, you know, I, I want to just put some nails in the coffin in some, in some issues. But I really, I, I want to get him live, face to face, and I want to catch him in a lie when I mention this to him and have him defend his book. It, but, you know, um, so inshallah, I mean, we have yeah. some things that, you know, we, we're going to start putting some nails in some coffins and bury these issues, inshallah. So. It's going to be buried. I mean, like you said, um, I've just um, put it up on the group chat where he says, Rabbi Tovia ben Eliza from the year 1050 to 1108. Now, this is before the reformation of, Christ, uh, of Christianity, like before yes. like 1500. So we're talking, what, roughly a thousand years ago, this scholar confirms that she was three years old, when uh, Rebecca was three years old when she married Isaac. He says Isaac was 37 years old at, uh, at his binding when Abraham returned from Mount Moriah. At that very moment, Sarah passed away and Isaac was then 37. And at that very time, Abraham was told Rebecca's birth. Thus, we find that Rebecca was three years old. Because right. it says Rebecca was born the year Sarah died. Yes. So, 
uh, and, and David, I mean, and, uh, Isaac, he married at the age of 40. Yes. So he was 37 when she died. Rebecca was born the year she died. And it says in the Bible, he married Rebecca when he was 40, which makes her three years old. Three years I mean, old. The, yeah, I mean, it's, it's clear, but... Um, I think, though, brother um, uh, Akil, uh, it's amazing that the Bible also says that Isaac tried 10 years to make her pregnant. So whether he tried from the age of three, four, five, six, I don't know. But if he's tried for 10 years, let's just even say he tried having sex with her from the time of 10 years old, when she was 20. 10 years he tried. So what does that tell you? I mean, we're not getting, we don't want to go vulgar like David Wood is going, but we're yeah, not, not at all. Not at all. We, which is for, for, for context. For context. That, you know, okay. You could disagree about the age of Aisha in, 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 in the seventh century and the oral culture and everything, but if you're going to try to prosecute the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, on this premise, then the grandfather of your Lord and Savior <laughs> married someone three years old and, according to their history, entered her at three years old in one day. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it, it, there's also um, a, a Jewish scholar, American academic Jewish scholar by the name of Jacob Norsner. He writes down a three-year-old and one day um, old uh, for berothold by intercourse is allowed. I mean, yes. that is part of the oral Talmudic ruling that they have. I mean, think of it like this. Jesus came and condemned the Jews um, for, the, uh, for following the oral laws and divorce and so and so. Yet he never condemned anyone for uh, child marriage. And this child marriage would have been active during the time of Jesus as well. Now, he knew about this, but he never condemned it because he knew that it would have been a tradition, a custom, something that was permissible at that time. We know from Sharia that um, now that the age of girl goes when she's you know, 16, 17, 18, she has to, and even Quran, for, for example, in the Quran, Allah tells us that she has to have sound judgment. She needs to be, uh, she needs to pass, you know, on her puberty. She needs to have sound judgment. Uh, so we know that she has to have her age now. Whereas during the time of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and onwards, it was a common practice. And um, we have hadith, um, uh, sorry, sayings from scholars during the, um, the time of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Uh, sorry, after the, after the time of Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, mm -hmm. that, um, for example, um, um, in Sana, Imam Shafi, Shafi, in Sana, I saw a grandmother who was 21 years old. She reached puberty at the age of nine and gave birth at the age of 10 uh, by Al Bayhaki. Um, no, it's common. We, this, this, this is common. We, it's, okay, we, we're not, we, we're not going to go back 14 centuries and try to prosecute a culture because they married young. No. And it's not, you know, in this culture. So, I mean, you know, you, you want to try to um, make attacks against Islam because uh, it, it, it had no problem with uh, young marriages when it's throughout your whole history uh, in terms of the uh, Jewish uh, Testament, the Old Testament. Um, but the, the problem is this. The, 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 problem, the problem is this. When you look at even today's... Um, um, laws or um, practices in America in the 1800s the age of consent was seven wow. in Delaware the, the majority of the states in, in America the age of consent was 10 years old at what a girl could be married at 10 but Delaware was one state the age was seven years old that means that in America people were marrying girls as young as seven years old yeah and then legally, legally, this was a law that if a girl, uh, parents, or she thought that she, you know, she wanted to get married at that age, then at the age of seven, uh, it was legal for her to be wedded. So, I mean, this is, it's just like, you know, people take stuff and like shock and awe. It's like, oh, wow, he did this and all of this stuff, man. Believe me, it's, it's, it's this drama. It's drama. And all you want to do is just bring. We want to just bring a level playing field and kind of equalize the matter and say, listen, okay. But, but what it is, Brother Akil, it's amazing, um, uh, subhanAllah, that you brought this up. Um, in India, or, or the eastern part of the world where my family are from, 
um, girls and boys were married at a young age. Let's just give an example. Um, Modi, the Prime Minister of India now, he, was, he got married when he was 13 years old and he's still living. So <laughs> Gandhi was, I think, uh, 12 years old and his wife was 12 years old also. Um, we're talking about figures that are like in India, some high like status in yeah. the sense of yeah. the um, political side. Now, uh, in the Bible refers to uh, young girls as Nara, as you know, in Hebrew, the Nara. Yeah. When we when we read, um, um, like for example, um, some of the characters of the Bible, we see that uh, Moses, Rebecca, yeah, yeah, of course, Moses, okay. Esther, she was a Nara when she married Xerxes, Dina, she got raped when she was what seven years old or something. She was eight years old when she was raped, and she got married to Shechem at the age of eight years old. This is according to scholars as well and the timeline of the Bible. King David, when he was seventy years old. He was given a 10-year-old girl, Abisag, so she can keep him warm in bed. Um, you know, it, it just got Ruth. She, she, she married Boaz when she was a Nara as well. And it's amazing that like in English, when we say a, a, a baby, a child, um, a teenager, uh, uh, an adult, we, we can give them a description of how old they are. So yes. a Nara would mean someone very young, whereas a Taf in Hebrew, when Moses, in, according to, I mean, David would know this, um, number seven. Maybe he wouldn't. Maybe, 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 maybe he wouldn't. No, he wouldn't. Uh, numbers 31, <laughs> Numbers chapter 31, uh, verse 17 to 18, when it says, Now kill all the men and boys, but keep all, and all the women who have slept with men, but keep all the infant girls. Infant is taf in Hebrew. T-A-P-H, you know, the taf. Now infant, then you got nara, then you got a teenager. So if Rebecca falls in the nara, somewhere between three four five six seven let's even say she's seven years old that was acceptable jewish rabbis don't have a problem what's amazing is that when we read the bible and we read Gen um, genesis when moses was a nar he was thrown in the chest and then he went all the way down to the palace of the pharaoh hmm. when jacob was a nar he was carried to you know ishmael was a nar he went he went with his mother sarah she carried him so we know that what nar would mean and, 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 and it's funny that um, the Hebrew is so explicit because the Talmud tells us that uh, it's permissible for a, for a man to marry a three-year-old girl and that girl is labeled as a nar as well. Mm -hmm. So the Hebrew words are, are, are working out. Whereas... No, they, so in English, we have, like, like you said, we have infant, we have toddler, we have... Um, I mean, we have levels uh, of, of growth by mm -hmm. which if we use a, a certain expression, people know there is. We have adolescent, we yes, have uh, teenager, we have adults, we have young adults. So just like we have in English, we also have these expressions in Hebrew and Arabic like this. You know, for instance, in Arabic, you have tifl, like, like a baby. You have ghulam, like a young boy. Yeah. You have shab, which is like, you know, so, someone. You have rajul, you have sheikh. You have these degrees of, 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 of uh, age. That you, when, when you use it, you know what range this person is from. Prophet Muhammad said to Ibn Abbas, he said, Ya Ghulam. Yeah. He's a Ghulam. What does that mean? That means he's a young boy. He's a young boy. So he's up, maybe up to about he's maybe. Young boy. Active young boy, yeah. Six, seven, eight, you know, around his age. You know, he didn't say, he didn't call him a shad, which is maybe like a little older. He didn't say, Ya Rajul. Or, I mean, so we, we, in every language, we have these specifications that delineate the age group age bracket so when the bible uses this we know what, what it's saying but the people they don't want to accept it so they deny it and they don't even know the word is in hebrew but, 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 but the jews don't bring this up the jews don't bring this up because they know that this is this was a common practice the jews don't bring this up it's the christians because they don't know they don't want to care what the jews say so they say ah oh, forget about them what they say we, we know what the Bible says, and the Bible doesn't mention yeah. an age consent. Well, now, okay, so the Bible doesn't mention an age consent. So how do you know that marrying a young girl um, is prohibited? I mean, the, no, Bible yeah. says, the Bible says if, if a man rapes a girl, then he has to uh, pay the father 50 shekels. Amazingly, the word rape a girl is nara. So if he rapes a three-year-old, four-year-old, five-year-old, six-year-old, seven-year-old girl, then he gets to keep the girl. Again, the word is used nara. Mm. Um, uh, 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 or isn't it for a woman in Hebrew? It's ish. Or it's like that, like a woman. 
uh, a wife, mm -hmm. a, a lady. So it's amazing that the Bible is explicit when it comes to child marriage. Songs of Solomon, what shall we do for our little sister whose breasts haven't grown yet? And if she gets, uh, if someone uh, wants to, calls out for marriage. I mean, it's amazing that it's all over the Bible. So you I think that what we need to do is actually we, we need to make a, a video just highlighting this issue alone. Yeah. Uh, and what we're going to do is just challenge. We're going to just challenge people like David Wood who constantly mocks the, the idea of Aisha being a young girl, you know, as in one of his recent videos, he, he put us in there, this, he, he had sex with a nine-year-old, all this. So since you, you, you want to keep on hopping on this, and I find it amazing too. I did a video against David Wood called In the Mind of David Wood. <laughs> the guy is very sick. Now, when you read the Hadith, the Hadith is vast. And oftentimes, you find Hadith repeated, not because the Prophet Muhammad is repeating over and over again, but because the compilers are bringing hadith over and over again. So David Wood, he goes into the hadith books and he focuses on the hadith as if somehow the prophet is repeating this thing over and over and over again. But when you look at one of his major themes, he has such a focus on the sexuality and sexual content of the life of Prophet Muhammad mm -hmm. He will be called what is called like a peeping time or pervert. Mm -hmm. He loves going and talking about the sexual life and history of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So we need to, you know, I did a video showing it. Like in his videos, how many times the guy mentioned sex, 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 this, this. I mean, it's, when you see it, it's like, man, this guy is sick. You know, but, you know, we, this is what we need to bring out so people can see what we're dealing with. To, to, to chase out these arguments right now, to keep on doing this, it's a waste of time. Expose him for what he is and who he is. And then we should, we should move on, inshallah. But I, mean, I think that um, a video on this would be very helpful just to give the Christians something to deal with. Here, you take this because you'd like to try to use this against the Prophet Muhammad as if somehow this taints him as being a prophet of God. Yeah. So then that means he's also Moses. That means also Isaac. That means also all these <laughs> other prophets. You know what I'm saying? So we just equalize it and bring context to the matter and say now what are you going to do no, but, but what makes me what makes me laugh is that the bible has no mentioning of age consent for marriage nor does the bible say in i mean they love using deuteronomy 18 from chapter 18 verse 18 to 20 something and they say look this is a description on how to identify a prophet now, yeah. amazingly, that description never tells us about a prophet marrying, marrying a young bride, which nullifies his prophethood. Rather, it says that if he introduces to you a different God, or if he speaks of something which didn't come to pass, then he's yeah. a false prophet. So yeah. we, we kind of say, okay, right, so the Bible's already given us a criteria on how to identify a prophet, and the marriage is not anywhere like part of that criteria. So, I mean, and plus you don't have any age consent for marriage. We're not promoting that child marriage should be active at this time, uh, or this day and age, but we understand during the past, it was something that was common. Why yes. didn't no Jews, no Christians, no atheists, um, or, or Quraysh, or the, um, the pagans, they never made mention of this to Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Why do we not historically find any sort of refutation in the book of Hadith? Why won't this a, an issue raised? Why doesn't the Quran mention about this? Rather, the Quran speaks about the marriage between Zayd um, and, and Zainab. Um, so this wouldn't have been an issue. It's like me saying to you, Brother Kyo, um, 500 years ago, it was common to, to carry a sword and a shield. Whereas I can't carry a sword and a shield now in the streets because I know the police is going to stop me. Something yes. that happened during the past time, we can't use that as an argument to say, oh, he is false or that was wrong. No, it was common. It wouldn't have yes. been wrong. Just the way 2,000 years ago, a man would have hunted another man and probably ate him just for survival reason. And it was common that time. Or that's a bad example. Um, Adam and Eve and um, his uh, the children of Adam and Eve uh, having... Um, marrying their own sisters because of the uh, expanding the generation it was it was something acceptable which we won't do now i don't know david would probably do it i don't know you know <laughs> no, i mean yeah this, this this historical relevance this context historically that things occurred and was a norm in this society we can't we can't somehow 
try to judge the society based on today's standards. Yeah, no. You know, say, oh, so I mean, it's it's it's, it's fallacious. But um, in any example that we can bring, uh, we can bring many. But we, you know, we can't do. All we want to do is say, listen, okay, you have an issue with this. Why don't you take the same issue up with your book? Yes. Forget about trying to explain it and you know make logic, um, uh, make it make it logical to people who don't have logic. But the point being, okay, you got a problem with a, a young girl being married, okay. How about this in your book? Over and over and over and over again. What are you going to do now? Yeah. How about also, and I made a video where there was this woman there that night uh, after the debate uh, that we put online about, you know, what was the age of, of, of Maryam, Mary, uh, uh, Lay Salaam, when God impregnated her? I saw the video, yeah. Historically, sure. historically there's, there's, there's a difference. For some say from 10 up to 12. So, you know, Still, you if if a, if a let's give the highest age, let's say 12, 13. If a twelve year old girl come home and say I'm pregnant, she will look, she will be looked down upon. Yes, yes. Yet God seen it appropriate to impregnate the mother of your Lord and Savior at this age, or if not younger. Exactly, but, but, but saying you that wanna hold, you want to hold God's today's standards and tell him somehow that he's a pedophile. Stuff for law, you know, saying for but this is because, but, but, but listen to this, brother, okay, which you raise a great point. Um, even though uh, Christians don't accept the books of Apoc uh, the Apocrypha books, Gospel of Thomas, I believe, and I'll get the reference, is that it mentions about Mary being 10 years old when she got married. Now, let's just even say, fine, for argument's sake, we're not going to even dispute that. For now, for argument's sake, let's just say the Bible was from the first century, the New Testament, Mark, Matthew, Luke, and John. And they were written during the time of Prophet, Prophet Isa, uh, alayhi salam, just as even argument's sake. The Apocrypha books would have come before the advent of Islam, which means it was written during the time of Christianity. We're talking now 1700 years ago. If a book mm -hmm. that says that Mary was 10 years old and they believe that 1700 years ago, then I'm going to say this is a work of history. Because to me, something that was written five years ago is a work of history. To mm. me, because it's something that's already happened. So, oh, for sure. Yeah. So, so I. Yeah, but, but, but the argument is going to be. The argument is going to be. So, again, we, we have to stop chasing them because they're going to keep on running. Yeah. All they do is just kind of like just cut off their avenues to keep running until they're now forced to deal with. You know, saying this little little box that we we call them in. So, for instance, they're gonna say, "Well, it's not mentioned in the Bible," and all they said was in the Bible. Okay, now you're a Bible only. So, tell me in the Bible where does it say that Jesus is the second person of a triune God wow. who has two natures? Tell me where does it say that Jesus is one percent man, one percent God? Tell me, I mean, tell me all of this creed you have. Tell me where is this mentioned in the Bible? Not there. Yeah, it's not there. So now what happens is that okay, you tell me you only accept the Bible, yet you accept the creed about your Lord and Savior is not mentioned in the Bible. So now how how do you get this? You believe in the creed, the creed. You have a creed. This creed is not from the Bible. It's a creed written by Christian scholars who thought it appropriate to to teach people what the church believed about their theology. So we gotta stop like allowing them to keep on running. So okay, you don't you know yeah. the Bible? Show me the Bible where it says this. Just force them. We, we gotta force them to confront. But they won't answer. Look, David Wood, like he tried to always get an answer. He won't answer. It's like exactly the same. Like with the Bible only. When I when a guy said to me that Jesus is like Moses, and um, I only accept the Bible, I said, okay, show me where Moses was circumcised, like Jesus. The Bible doesn't mention in circumcision. Only is found in the Talmud, in the oral law. I said, you can't show me where he got circumcised, so he's not like Moses anymore. So it's one of them things that certain things are not found in the Bible. The Jews know that. This is why the Jews say there are two Bibles. One is the uh, the Torah, and the second is the second oral law. Which yes. Both apparently came down from Moses. Um, so, so, so when they don't answer and it's clear they run away from it, then we, we, we highlight that, okay, we brought them the examples, and now they won't deal with it. So now let the audience you know, see that, listen, 
We brought them the evidence. We brought them the proofs from their book, and they won't even deal with their book now. And now it becomes upon them. It becomes upon them. So this is what we have to do, inshallah. We have to, you know, uh, we have to be more strategic. But, you know, we, we want to do it in confronting them. We want to try to confront them and make them, force them to deal with the things that, you know, um, that they, they, they hate to, to deal with. The problem is they like to run and they like to make, you know, say these accusations against Islam from behind cameras and videos. Like I said, you know, David Wood, he's a camera boy crusader. This is, this is you know, he, he gives his nickname for Muslims, uh, uh, keyboard uh, jihadis or jihad, you know. So, okay. You are a camera boy crusader. You on your crusade behind your camera, and you know you you scared to come out. You know, saying and face you know the people uh, face to face. Because last you time you messaged him about your debate with him, like any messages or nothing. No, no, I haven't had I haven't heard anything as a follow up and nothing uh, in terms of reaching out. And I haven't sent as well anything to him because I don't have as if it's kind of it's contact information. The email we used before he blocked me. So, uh, but I mean, I, I, I made another public appeal to him on a video. He seen my videos, proof of it, he played it. So I know he's watching the videos, uh, but he, you know, David, David Wood don't want to debate me. But line is, this third, want to... third one. We're going to have to upload this third video that we're recording now and then publicly say to David Wood that you have a challenger that's been challenging you for the last, what, four years and you've been running away from him. Um, it's just not your character. I mean, you seem to attack Muslims again behind um, the camera. Why not confront um, the the Muslim who's actually trying to have a discussion with you? I mean, I don't understand why is he? What is he afraid of? There's something that's really getting to him. But Muhammad yeah. Hijab has already destroyed him, and I think you're going to completely like annihilate him. So this is going to be the last final debate he may have. So. Is uh, that Maybe, I mean, maybe he probably don't even do any more debates because he feels that, you know, he loses in the debates, so, and he don't make any money off him. Okay, so, money from, you know, so, so brother, Allah, 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 inshallah. He, he, inshallah, if he, if he has a debate with you, do you think he's worried that he's going to lose a lot of his followers and then he lose a lot of money as well, coming from those followers, saying, wait a second, we've paid you all this all along, thinking that you're someone big and you're, you can take all the Muslims on, but now... Brother Akil comes in, he kills you, <laughs> and now we... we Figur we're... Figuratively, figuratively. Yeah, yeah. Figuratively. <laughs> he kills you in the debate, in the dialogue. Um, he lose a lot of... Um, uh, I mean, now he's promoting uh, Vocal uh, Malone and uh, uh, John McCry, I think it's that, if that's his name. He's promoting them now. What is he trying to exit? No, what, no what, what it is is that he... he, he... Two things. One, he realized his arguments are, are played out. You don't have anything left. And also, it's because maybe some of the pressure that if they, if they suspend his accounts, he still want to try to uh, continue on uh, in another way. Um, so he's just trying to cover his, cover his ground because he realized that the walls are closing in on him. Um, but again, you know, David Wood is um, in his mind, he, he, he don't think the same way normal people think so um like this april fool jokes when he came and said i'm leaving um youtube when i when i seen it i i knew it was because i i know the guy i i, I know him i it's kind of he can't fool anybody the thing is is just we need to get this to the people so people can understand what we're dealing with even his own followers thought he was leaving and it was sad and oh don't go but i told the muslims i said listen it's a joke it's april fools it's a prank, and we got to be more mindful of you know what we're dealing with and how to deal with them. I said, if you do me, a Christian guy lied. He's being a Christian and he lied. Is that what you're? Well, I mean, to him, it's a joke. So it's April Fools, and they, they believe in um, mocking people or making uh, trickery or April Fools. So I mean, I, I'm not gonna say okay, try to use this as, a, as a say okay, you're a liar, but it's a joke. Okay, in any case. To me, it was clear what it, it, it was, because I know the kind of individual that I'm dealing with. His livelihood is dependent upon this. And then he had the audacity to say, the reason he don't have a job is because if he started working, the Muslims would go and make a problem for him at work, and then he'll lose his job. Oh, so, man. this guy... <laughs> oh my gosh, are you serious? Is that what he said? No way. He said, he said listen, he said uh, he, he, he got a master's degree in psychology. 
He said he should be somewhere teaching as a professor, but if he was there, the Muslims would come and boycott him and make a harassment, and then he would lose his job. So he said, in order to avoid this, I figure I just stay home and make videos against his Muslims. And that way I, I make my money off it. The guy is a bum. <laughs> <laughs> He's a disgrace. I'm telling you, David Wood must be the him, 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 and, him, him and his crony, Sam Shimon, who is another guy who have a job. This guy's not, he, he don't get a job. Can you imagine? Don't work. You know, but the thing is, Sam Shimon, because of his, he's a fanatical Christian, so he must talk about Christianity in the Bible, but nobody wanted to hear about this. Talking about the Bible don't make you money. That's yeah. why he's broke. David Wood at least has a little bit of sense. He said, listen, I don't need to talk about Christianity because I ain't going to get paid to talk about Christianity. I'm going to talk about Islam because my, my Islam and talking about Islam as Islamophobe makes me money. So I'm going to get 300,000 subscribers. I'm going to get thousands of dollars on Patreon because people like to hear negativity against Islam. Yes. So when Sam Shimon realized that he needs to up his ante against Islam and leave Christianity alone, he probably had a little more money in his pocket too. But until that point, he's going to be jobless and begging other Christians to keep on funding him, you know saying, for nothing. He don't have a ministry. He don't have anything. These guys are bombs, man. I mean, they're bombs. They're, they're bombs. Shocked. I mean, I, I, just, I just hope our brothers and sisters are going to watch this and they're going to learn from this and say, hold on a second. Is this who David Wood really is? That he's taking money off gullible people just by entertaining them? Like you said, he's a showman. He's an entertainer. That's exactly, he's an entertainer. And he know talking to Islam is a hot subject and it brings you money. People who want to make money, oh, I used to be Muslim. I'm now Muslim now. I write a book. And you get so many views. Look at this guy a couple years ago came out, don't convert to Islam. Look at his story when he first came out. He came out of a video smoking. 100,000 uh, views in a couple of days. No one knew about him before. He was supposed to be Muslim. Now we exposed him. When he came out, we went right at him. We exposed him and I highlighted his history and why he left Islam and all that stuff. Now he's begging for money now. Because you know, people realize what he is. And he's not a good he's not a good showman. He don't have the kind of charisma and the sarcasm and uh, the drama that David Wood has. Mm -hmm. So because of that, he ain't gonna make the kind of money David Wood gonna make. You it's know? True. Christian Prince. The guy is a, he spent eight hours, excuse me, eight hours online talking against Islam. No way. Yes. If it is eight hours long, eight hours, that's a job. Oh my gosh. Seriously, I'm just straight, straight. He's another disgrace, I'm telling you. That guy. Yeah, but, but, but this is the kind of people that we're dealing with, we need to see that, yeah, yeah. you know, we, keep, we, we can't keep on trying to... He doesn't the talk argument. about Bible. He doesn't talk about Christianity. But there's a guy that told me, why do you not? Why do you Muslims not debate Christian Prince? I said, because he doesn't want to debate on the Bible. I said, he's made thousands and thousands and thousands of video probably on Islam. Let him make it. Why does he not talk about the Bible? What is he afraid of? He knows he can't defend his own book. Why, why, why is it that we have to go by his demand? Now we have to ask him, is he willing to debate us? And now... He's just nowhere to be found. Forget about debating some of these guys like this now. What we need to just do is expose what they're into, what they're doing. The arguments they're making is, you know, it's already been refuted. Maybe Chris and Prince, he goes into some other books, some books from the Shia, and, you know what I'm saying, bring these yeah. arguments that they make against. But the point being, the point being is that they do it, it's all about money. Yeah. They don't care about the truth. Yeah. A couple of years ago, I debated Chris and Prince. It was supposed to be. A, a formal debate on a different forum from um, from Power Talk. The first topic was about Christianity. Is Jesus God or something like this? He suffered like um, very bad. He, I mean, he lost the debate very bad. It's clear. The next the topic was this topic. His topic was Islam in general. He started talking about nonsense. He started muting me. It went into like one of those power talk situations. And it was like difficult because now I don't know if I'm muted. I don't know if you can hear me. I don't know. It wasn't supposed to be like this. Yeah. But the point being, the first part of the, uh, the debate, the first session, we were talking about the Bible. The guy, he, he failed miserably. That's what I'm saying. Do you have that video? <laughs> Funny thing is, 
when we did it, he put a copyright on it. And if I had copied it and posted it, he would have flagged me and got my channels um, taken down or whatever the case was. So I left it. I didn't. I, I didn't. I couldn't record it. But it is online. It is online somewhere posted. I seen it online somewhere posted. Uh, but he even changed the account because he got like three YouTube pages. I mean, you know, this guy too. I confronted him. Yeah, I mean, he, he didn't think I. He didn't think that I was gonna show up and you know. So these guys are cowards, man. The waste. So um, inshallah, we've got for a few minutes left for this to um go uh, remaining. But um, I just wanna. Yeah. Conclude by we, we can conclude inshallah. We can conclude and then we'll make this video into parts inshallah and highlight just take some like excerpts out. You can take some oh. excerpts out and uh, put a maybe five minute video for this topic and for that one that we discussed, half an hour, however it is. But uh, alhamdulillah, uh, you know, we got to just expose people for who and what they are. And then when we do that, the, the arguments will be seen. The arguments is 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 like nothing, of course. Their arguments but, are easy to break. I mean, jazakallah khair for. Hard effort for the deen and for Islam, I mean, you've you've literally gone beyond the call of duty. Um, uh, mashallah, it's a pleasure, man. It's uh, a pleasure. Like you've always, uh, one thing I've realized about you since I've known you for many years now is that you've always been active when it comes to the deen and dawah, it's especially Islam. You you promote more about Islam than promoting what their jokes are. I mean, now you're trying to expose them, but that wasn't initially your plan. You're like, I just want to, I just want to invite. But they've yeah, we, wanted to, we, went, we went to defend Islam and, and teach people with the, the true uh, position of Islam is only thing that they accuse us of. You know what I'm saying? But I mean, our deen is our passion. We love it. We love being Muslims, so we love to talk about it. I don't. I don't need to have a channel just talking against Christianity no. for the sake of talking against it. No, no. Our mission is to def defend and clarify what Islam is, yes. and we take anybody on, inshallah. So. Jazakallah khair. 